All right, welcome folks to uh, the Kashmir Palestine Scholars Solidarity Network launch. Uh, this event is being hosted at the Kenyan Institute. Uh, the Kenyan Institute is the Jerusalem affiliate of uh, the Council for British Research in the Levant, which is an independent UK research charity and membership organization that exists to conduct, support, and promote humanities and social science research in the Levant. With that said, allow me to say that this event is not a, an event directly of the Council for research, uh, British Research in the Levant, but is an independent initiative of two scholars, myself, as well as Dr. Emma Brandlund from University of West of England. Uh, allow me to say that, okay, so uh, uh, this event, which now has is the first time that we are able to launch an event that is hybrid in nature from Jerusalem. So we have an in-person audience in Jerusalem, as well as folks online uh, in, uh, in the universe, <laughs> wherever they are. So, which is quite exciting for us, and we're very happy to have that. Um, because something like the Kashmir Palestine Scholars Solidarity Network could not really be launched or exist were it just to be focused in Jerusalem or in Srinagar and Kashmir itself. It indeed is something much larger and that is partially behind why we are trying to use technology to take advantage of it, to make connections uh, for an academic uh, purpose that we see as very fitting and necessary in the current circumstances. As I mentioned before, this event is taking place in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood. The in-person audience here is a bit thin, but not bad. I don't want to put anyone down, but I do want to uh, reference the fact that the entirety of Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood has been actually shut down to traffic. And uh, we are unable to actually have unfortunately, and in many ways is very indicative of the situation here that we are very much underneath the prerogatives of uh, the occupation uh, government. With that said, I don't want to distract ourselves from our larger purpose today, but obviously the things I have mentioned are not disentangled from that today. My name, as I said, is Tofik Haddad. I'm the director of the Kenyan Institute, but this initiative is an initiative that I got into that came out of what was a British Academy uh, uh, Frontiers of Knowledge Seed Grant Program. So just to give a little background on this, essentially 20 academics from the region and 20 academics from the UK were invited, had to apply, of course, and met in Amman in January 2020, just before COVID started, and where everybody presented on what they were doing and their academic interests, and then uh, were given a very short, limited period of time, 24 hours, to try and cook up a project of interest. I, I spoke to my political interests, which are largely in uh, Palestinian political economy and Arab political economy, development studies, et cetera. And uh, Dr. Brandlund spoke to hers, and uh, we quickly were able to identify that Palestine and Kashmir have so many points of intersection, but unfortunately, spaces of communication, exchange, networking, as well as funding, and speaking openly within the academic community uh, are not present. And we thought it would be a good idea to try and pitch to the British Academy that something like this community in Jerusalem and the wider occupied Palestinian territories, as well as in Kashmir and Srinagar and beyond Jammu Kashmir. So uh, I readily admit that I did not know very much about Kashmir. I knew something insofar as at some stage I was asked by the Institute of Palestinian Studies to actually produce an article on the changing strategic and political 
periphery of the Palestinian cause, in particular, the changing relations between Israel and India and Palestine and India. As many people may know, and the most stalwart supporters of the Palestinian case, and this came out in UN resolutions and many other, other points, but things have drastically changed today. I do not want to go into the points of intersection too much between Kashmir and Palestine, because that is not the role of my discussion here today and our role. Our role is actually to launch the, this network as an independent uh, initiative of the folks we have mentioned. I also want to say that we spent the first two years of this coalition slowly building and reaching out to individual academics in Palestine, as well as in Kashmir and the broader diasporas of both academic communities to find, uh, to, to bring them on board, the nature of this event and the nature of the political and academic settings for both Palestine and Kashmir are highly charged and under threat and highly policed. In fact, uh, some of the people we actually reached out to were willing to be engaged in the network but we're not willing to go public and speak about it because of the actual repression involved in that. And that I believe speaks to the need for this, something we will hear more about from our keynote speaker tonight, Dr. Goldie Asuri, who will speak to the need for this and, and beyond. Before I get there, I just want to allow space and time for my colleague to speak and to present what we have done and some of the conceptions and how tonight's event will take place. Uh, so to hand over the microphone to uh, uh, Dr. Brandland, and she can speak about her own engagement in this and how this project came about and where we seek to go forward from here. So here you go. Hopefully everyone has been able to hear. Please, if you have not heard or have any issues, let them be known in the chat room and uh, we'll try to address them. Uh, so on to Dr. Brandon. Thank you so much. And uh, so, yes, hello, everyone. And thank you for coming uh, online and here in Jerusalem. It's great to be here. I just arrived last night, so I'm having my own crash course to the place. And it's been a really interesting day so far. And uh, walking around in East Jerusalem and experiencing, uh, witnessing some of these things that this project is about happening around us. It's my first time here. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I'm, I work as a senior lecturer at the University of West of England, and my research interests uh, revolve around uh, gender and women's activism in Kashmir, and particularly around how insecurity caused by different forms of military oppression, occupation, settler colonialism impacts gender norms um, and experiences of experiences of, um, of everyday life um, in areas impacted by these things. Um, and yeah, and so I think when uh, me and Tufik started talking uh, back in Amman, so almost, almost three years ago now, um, for us um, both thinking about what has happened in Kashmir since uh, August 2019 and the abrogation of uh, the special status of Kashmir that existed previously in the Indian constitution and the, the following um, enforced lockdowns, uh, in internet and communication blackouts, uh, the arrests of political activists, human rights activists, journalists, and um, politi political politicians from all different camps, as well as what we see now more recently uh, also um, uh, arrests of academics and journalists. Um, we, yeah, we were thinking in terms of what can we bring, and I think particularly me as, uh, as being a non-Kashmiri, being quite, oh, quite concerned, being quite conscious about my own position and identity, and what I bring to my 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 research and my my my, my limited activism, my attempts at activism once in a while. Um, so we thought that this, this network could become, or that the, the, 
it could be productive to have a space for scholars to meet, for academics to talk and share, share knowledge, uh, share, build, build contacts and find ways to collaborate. Um, so we're quite excited after having trying to figure out some of the, I guess, the practicalities of it and how to go about. And I'm not sure uh, there's, I think things can always have been done differently. Uh, looking back, maybe, maybe we could have taken made other decisions throughout in some some sometimes during this process. But at the same time, I'm very excited that we are finally uh, presenting something to the wider world. And I feel like today it feels particularly important. Um, so we want this. Uh, I think we already mentioned this. We want this uh, network to become. Um, Hopefully, we want to connect with uh, academics, but also with other uh, um, already existing networks and uh, institutes who are working on similar issues. So we ultimately want this to be a collaborative and open space and a space where people can come and, uh, and feel being part of. And so today, tonight, we're the opening event. We're delighted to have Dr. Goldie Osturi here. Um, and tomorrow we are launching our conversation series, which would be, uh, which is our, again, our second big thing after the, after the launch. And so throughout the winter, we're going to have um, a monthly uh, sem online seminar uh, on different themes. So we're looking at economic dimensions. We're looking at um, popular resistance, we're looking at poetry and literature, we are looking at, um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and we want to have speakers from, uh, speakers who work in Kashmir, uh, speakers who work in Cal uh, Palestine to come together and share their, share their research and basically in engage in, in knowledge exchange and engage in a dialogue. And uh, so hopefully everyone, everybody will join us on that. You can find our website and uh, the program. Uh, but today then, so the, uh, our event today is um, Goldie uh, will speak. And so Goldie is a professor in sociology at Warwick. And she's written the book Religious Freedom in India, Sovereignty and Anti-Conversion from 2013. She's also widely published in international journals such as Third World Quarterly, Third World Thematics, and she has an edited volume called Kashmir and Palestine Archives of Coloniality and Solidarity, uh, edited together with Ather Zia, uh, who uh, will also speak at one of our conversations later on in the winter. And this was published in Identity 2020. So we feel that particularly with uh, Goldie's, uh, Goldie's work, she's also organized uh, workshops and seminars at uh, Warwick on, the, um, on Kashmir and Palestine. So we thought, we are really excited and delighted to invite Goldie to speak today. The so Goldie will speak for approximately half an hour, a little bit more maybe, and then uh, we'll open for questions and comments from audience here, but also online. So hope everybody will enjoy and engage in today's session. Um, thank you so much. Um, a big thanks to um, Dr. Tafi Haddad and um, Dr. Emma Brendan. Um, it's really, I'm really grateful. I actually feel privileged uh, to be invited here um, to uh, speak at this launch uh, because we know that in the necropolitical worlds that occupied people's living, we can witness it with the uh, shutdown of Sheikh Jara at the moment, networks of solidarity are needed and struggles for justice are interlinked. Um, and, you know, conversely, more than ever, expressions of solidarity are also targeted by settler colonial states. Um, so this is why um, this is needed. So thank you for initiating um, this network, um, for strengthening, expanding networks of solidarity between scholar activists of Kashmir and Palestine. Um, so I'm a bit, uh, I wish I could be more casual, but I can't quite speak without referencing notes. <laughs> so I am going to be referencing my notes if that's okay. Um, speaking of solidarity, um, I want to express my own solidarity as someone marked as Indian, Indian, Australian, and now a UK citizen 
My itinerary is that of someone who understands myself as having a colonized history, but also moving to an understanding of myself as a beneficiary of the settler colonialisms of indigenous nations in the US and in Australia. And in the context at which I'm speaking, I'm an Indian subject with an ethical obligation to speak about the settler colonialism in Kashmir. Um, and also speaking at this amazing location, the Kenyan in Institute. Um, and here, I think we're surrounded by colonialism and anti-colonialism um, in a way. So it's a really good place. Um, I feel really honored to be here. So I express my anti-colonial solidarity with Palestinians and with the Palestinian struggle. So in the time I have, um, I think I'll speak a little bit about the kind of solidarities that Kashmiris have expressed, scholar, activists, and artists, uh, what Arthur Zia has called a, a resonant affective solidarity in her article in the Kashmir Palestine issue that we co edited. Um, and I want to link this solidarity to the histories of Kashmir and Palestine that are quite different. And so we must uh, acknowledge that difference. But they're also connected and generated by what I would call these intersecting structural principles of settler slash colonialism. So I'll just um, start, that's actually the, I will refer to this statement, the BDS statement on Kashmir in August, 2019, but I wanted to just show this idea of these interconnected struggles through that uh, image. So this is um, two images here by the Kashmiri artist Mir Sohel. Um, the first is a poster, Occupational Hazards. That was the um, colloquium we organized at the University of Warwick. Um, and you know, we, we commissioned Mir Sohail um, to design that poster. And I didn't tell him what to do, but he came up with that image. And it was quite moving because, of course, it's a reconfiguration of the whole Sistine Chapel image of um, you know, God and I think it's Adam. <laughs> but here it's... Um, a kind of affirmation of mutual humanity, but also solidarity. I thought that was quite moving. Um, but that was not the first um, expression of solidarity that Mir, Mir Suhail has sketched um, in 2014 and the strikes um, uh, in Gaza. Um, he had this kind of mirror image of Kashmir and Gaza of one people seeing themselves reflected in, a, in another struggle, which is a very, you know, astute visual political commentary. Um, there are other long history of um, expressions of Kashmiri solidarity. Usma Falag has written about this in 2014. She talks about the 1960s where protests over the desecration of Al-Aqsa Mosque resulted in killings and curfew. There were student protest marches in 1988. In the summer of 2014, Falag speaks of tricolor Palestinian flags fluttering over cars, electric poles, and shops in Srinagar. Um, young college girls were marching and shouting pro-Gaza chants. For these acts of resistance, a teenage boy, Suhail Ahmed Shah, was killed. Arthur Zia has spoken of the hundreds of rallies Kashmiris held in protest in 2018, when the US embassy moved from Tel Aviv to um, Jerusalem. Um, in 2021, during um, the Israeli air, land, and sea strikes on Gaza, with a Sir Gul, a professional graffiti artist, at the request of his neighborhood uh, in Srinagar, was arrested for three days for this mural, We Are Palestine, um, and he was made to deface his own mural. Yet this solidarity, this resonant affective solidarity is part of the fabric of Kashmiri life, um, from poetry to art to scholarship. For example, um, and this, you know, the, uh, their wounds are our wounds. We know what it is to be Makhbuza or occupied. This is the title of Zia's article. It's, from, it's a quote from a research partner. Um, so such expressions of solidarity and their silencing with death, with arrests, illustrate the levels at which Kashmiris are censored and silent from even the act of expressing solidarity. So there have been Palestinian voices in support of Kashmir. Sheikh Shokat Hussain, a Kashmiri academic, has spoken of the 1926 Grand Mufti of Jerusalem as a staunch supporter of Kashmir. And of course, in 2019, you had the BDS movements um, issuing a statement saying, as Palestinians, we deeply feel the suffering of the people. 
in Kashmir under military repression that is similar to Israeli forms of subjugation and control. So of course, there's this emphasis on we feel the suffering. So these forms of solidarity challenge both occupations. As Falak has stated, resistance and solidarity can make borders porous. So I'm invoking these Kashmiri scholars and artists speaking about these visceral visual images of solidarity to indicate that these heartfelt forms of solidarity are rooted in the shared histories of British colonialism and its present legacies in the making of the nation states of Israel and India. The solidarities are not only heartfelt, of course, they're made through activism and engagement. And of course, this network, I think, is going to be part of that alongside other efforts. Um, so here, I, the reason why I want to bring this notion of heartfelt link, this notion of heartfelt forms of solidarity to histories or historical context, is I'm saying that there's a reason why there's this affective solidarity. Um, and it relates to the settler colonial analytic, which enables the understanding of the commonality of features at the intersection of colonialism and settler colonialism. So often we think of Kashmir context as colonial history and Zionist um, context as settler colonialism from the word go. And so that's why these um, histories are considered different. But I think my the thesis I'm putting forward is that there are intersecting features which bring these together. And this is why there are, uh, you know, consequentially commonalities between the histories of Palestine and Kashmir. So um, just a quick, um, I mean, we can come back to this in question time if people have questions. This is, I mean, a Kashmiri audience would already know that this map, this map is actually a United Nations map because in, in India, it's a, it's a crime, it's sedition to show Kashmir as, uh, you know, um, so-called disputed territory. Um, so this is just to say that, show the splintering of the regions of Jammu and Kashmir, a part of the erstwhile princely state of Jammu and Kashmir is now Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Band. Baltistan under Pakistan administered Kashmir, another part is under Chinese control, Aksai Chin, and the regions of Indian administered Kashmir are Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh, and these were undemocratically and unconstitutionally annexed in 2019, and the Indian controlled state of Jammu and Kashmir was downgraded to two union territories, Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh, and it is um, currently directly under government um, the lieutenant gov governor's rule. This doesn't mean that it wasn't under government, the Indian government uh, government's rule, but there was this kind of um, buffer of a local government, which was largely, one could say, like a collaborator puppet kind of regime. But now even that is gone, like any veneer of that um, buffer um, um, government is gone. So. The next, I don't have to explain this map to this audience, I don't think, but I've just put it up there just to note um, a couple of points. Um, you know, uh, you all know Palestine and Palestinian allied has historians, social and legal scholars, such as Masalha, Khalidi, Pape, Shaluk, Kvurkin, Hanie, Haddad, Bandar, Irakat, et cetera, have documented and analyzed how a neoliberal capitalist settler colonial history has splintered and controlled people's lands and resources and continues to do so, criminalizing and terrorizing uh, Palestinian self-determination and liberatory struggles. So what I want to really emphasize there is I'm, I'm turning to Fayez Sayeg's 1965 analysis to reference this idea of the aims of Zionist settler colonialism. Again, I don't have to explain this to this audience, but I'm just I'm for emphasizing a couple of points that in the first instance, um, you know, the Zionist Congress meets in 1897 after the 1884 Berlin Congress Scramble for Africa Conference. Its main aim is search for a homeland, a nation state through colonization. So this is why it's settler colonialism. And it's also ethno-nationalist because it's based on alleged racial and religious bonds. And so the main point, um, as Arij Sabarkuri argues that it, at its inception, it uses the terminology of colonization and, the, and permanent settlement. So this is not the case, of course, with Kashmir, we know that. 
Um, the other point that I wanted to emphasize is that the Zionist project does not take off until its collaboration with British imperialism. So while there are early Jewish, European Jewish settlers, uh, it is after the Balfour Declaration and British conquest of Jerusalem um, that the Zionist project begins to have some success. Um, and of course, the Balfour Declaration announces the intention of creating a Jewish national homeland. Um, so the point of emphasizing these two points is that if we consider the vocabulary of colonialism and imperialism as part of Zionist lexicon from its very beginning, then some might argue that the historical context of Kashmir is quite different, and it is. But there are also points of intersection in this history between colonialism and the distinct features of settler colonialism in Palestine. So this intersection is about the equation of an exclusive religious identity and the conversion of land into territory. So in Kashmir, there's a process of territorializing and exclusively indigenizing a Hindu religious sovereignty through British sale of the region and colonial knowledge production. Um, so that's why I have that question up there. Can we understand settler colonialism and colonialism as distinct but intersecting structuring principles and features? Um, the second point I have up there is from Lloyd and Wolf's argument, David Lloyd and Patrick Wolf, where they're talking about settler colonialism as foundational for the current neoliberal political, economic, social, and racial order. And they say settler colonialism and military occupation would continue to shape not only the states that locally originated in them, but increasingly the emergent global order that settler colonialism underpins. And so I think one of the points to emphasize there, or what the point that they're making is that this, is, this becomes crucial in thinking about the neoliberal present in the management of native surplus, what they call native surplus populations. So one could say that these intersecting practices of colonialism and settler colonialism continue to be refined and deployed against indigenous populations even as these populations continue to challenge them. Um, so with this in mind, I turn to the history of the creation of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir in 1846. So just to give you the sense of this intersecting commonality. So 1846, the Treaty of Amritsar, which is considered to be uh, you know, that particular mark where there's this transformation of the history of Jammu and Kashmir. So in 1846, the British East India Company sells the regions of Kashmir and, and its peoples um, through the Treaty of Amritsar to the Dogra feudatory of the Sikh Empire. They're, they're fighting the Sikhs um, and Gulab Singh, who's a, a Dogra collaborator who used to work for the Sikh Empire, switches his allegiances, collaborates with the British, then they sell it to him. One of the theories is they sell this wholesale region because they want a buffer between British India and Russia, Russian imperialism. That's one theory. Um, and the sale did not, so my point here is, I mean, this history is quite well known among Kashmir scholars and Kashmiris, but the sale did not involve only the wholesale transfer of native peoples and lands to an alien ruler. As Mridur Rai has argued, it also involved a transformation of the practice of sovereignty in the region. The British invested this ruler with exclusive sovereignty, albeit under their indirect observational eye, replacing earlier forms of shared sovereignty, where there was scope for local power sharing arrangements. And this transformation of sovereignty has consequences. And what the British do is indigenize an exclusionary Hinduized sovereignty over a diverse peoples and lands. So um, there's quite a, a bit of scholarship on this. I've just put up some of the books on this. For example, um, um, British traveler and residence accounts of the period between 1846 and early 20th century show that Dogra rule was extremely repressive and cruel to Kashmiri Muslims. Religious affiliation became the basis for instituting hierarchies of land administration. There was a whole bu intricate bureaucracy set up um, and Kashmiri pundits or Hindus were put in these positions of power and Kashmiri Muslims, even um, landowners, for example, were dispossessed from any kind of power sharing ar arrangements. And there was extreme exploitation 
of largely Kashmiri Muslim artisans and peasants. Um, so, you know, you do have people writing about the first sort of uh, major sort of work, a strike of um, artisans weaving shawls because shawls, shawls were a major part of international trade and made the Dogras rich, but the artisans themselves were in extreme poverty, for example. So, and this dispossession also took the, simultaneously took the form of knowledge production about Kashmir as an ancient Hindu land. Um, and so you have this text, um, Raja Tarangini, which is a 12th century in, uh, text, of a history of kings of Kashmir, uh, but it erases its Persian influences. It also erases uh, Kashmir's more heterogeneous history of the various traditions of Buddhism, Islam, and a very distinctive form of Hinduism as practiced by Kashmiri pundits. Um, Jah Ananya Jahanara Kabir talks about, um, in her book, um, Territory of Desire, talks about um, the British administrator, Walter Lawrence, who constructs Kashmiri antiquity as the holy land for Hindus in this book called um, The Valley of Kashmir, which comes out in 1895. And my point is that this Hinduization of Kashmir is not only about Hindutva in the current regime of Hindu nationalist, Hindu fascist power in India. This Hinduization of Kashmir informs both Indian secular and Hindutva colonial claims to Kashmir. Um, I mean, I kind of explored this commonality or complicity between Indian secularism and um, Hindutva in the 2013 book. But in this context, it's a slightly different point to make. So why, why do I make this claim? Um, so one of the, I mean, just as an example, um, you have um, the first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, who is touted as you know, secular in his outlook and approach and so on. Um, he writes the foreword to his bro brother-in-law's translation of the 12th century text, Raja Tarangini, which I mentioned earlier. And here he, he writes in the foreword, Kashmir had been the meeting ground of different cultures of Asia, the Western Greco Roman and Iranian and the Eastern Mongolian. But essentially he says it was a part of India and the inheritor of Indo-Aryan traditions. Now, Chitraleka Zutshi, who, who writes about this, frames Nehru as reading this text as part of secular nationalist tradition claiming it for India rather than for Hindu tradition. But I would also argue that it is significant that Jawaharlal Nehru is writing this as a foreword to a text, Raja Tarangini, which actually indigenizes this idea, which has been indigenized uh, by a colonial administrator, calling it, you know, um, using that text, for example, to um, claim Kashmir as the holy land for Hindus. Right. So I feel like there's this kind of complicity between Indian secularism constantly and Hindutva. So I reference this history to suggest that while Zionism was an ethno-nationalist project establishing itself through settler slash colonialism with British collaboration, British Orientalism and colonialism had a significant role to play in constructing knowledge about Kashmir as a Hindu holy land, both for the secularists and for uh, Hindu nationalists. Um, and I would argue that these intersecting histories of religious and racialization of land and place as ethno-nationalist Jewish and Hindu can be understood as part of the structuring principle of settler slash colonialism. Um, so I'm going to make a very big jump here. <laughs> so please pardon me for this uh, big jump historically. But to 8, 1494, I'm going to the Treaty of Tordesillas. Um, and the Treaty of Tordesillas uh, is a treaty between Spain and Portugal, which divided the non-European worlds into two halves for discovery and conquest. They actually had a meridian longitude in a line. Uh, the reason I'm referencing this is I feel like it illustrates the ways in which almost this is almost like an inauguration of that settler colonial structuring principle of equations between land, territory, and religion as available for conquest. Um, it is supported by, of course, the papal bull, um, Intercetera II, uh, one that authorized the states of Spain and Portugal 
to quote, explore, subdue, and assert dominion over all non-Christian peoples and lands worldwide on behalf of and in the name of Christendom. Now, these histories of racial and religious categorization were deployed, of course, against Muslims and Jews within Europe with devastating consequences. Um, but I refer to them here as they appear to structure the ways in which settler colonial principles underpin and justify demarcations and equations of sovereignty, territory, race, and religion, uh, what one could call the ethno-sacralization of land. So this you know, idea that this land is exclusively this particular religious identity. And that's devastating, has devastating consequences, as we know with Zionist settler colonialism and with um, the construction of uh, Kashmir as a holy Hindu land. And of course, the Treaty of Thordesi has, uh, hap is also made just after the return of Columbus from his alleged discoveries and before the voyages of Vasco da Gama to India. So it's just at that moment. Um, so consequences for Kashmir, by 1947, Kashmir is a Hindu princely state. Its ruler had already been facing the quit Kashmir movement from Kashmiri nationalists, both Hindu and Muslim, for almost 20 years. By then, formally, I mean, there were rebellions before that, but he's also facing an armed rebellion against his feudal rule from the regions of Poonch and Mirpur. In 1947, the Maharaja supported the massacre of 200,000 or more Jammu Muslims by Hindutva organizations, following the stories of partition atrocities in West Punjab and Mushtaq and Amin's essay on settler colonialism and in Kashmir names this attempt at demographic change in 1947 as part of the logic of settler colonialism. And so following the declaration of free or Azad Kashmir in October, 1947, uh, the entry of tribal and Azad Kashmir militias threatening to invade the Kashmir Valley to free Kashmir. The Maharaja asks help from the new leadership of India, which is Nehru and um, the interim governor, um, Governor General Lord, uh, Lord Mountbatten. Lord Mountbatten uh, is said to have um, said, you can place this condition of accession um, before the armed troops support the Maharaja. And so Kashmir accepts, accedes to India at that point. The Maharaja rather te uh, provisionally, tem temporarily accedes to India. The first Kashmir war is subsequently fought between India and Pakistan. The UN resolutions 47 to 56 articulate Kashmiri right to self-determination. Nehru promises a plebiscite for Kashmiris as part of these UN resolutions. And the plebiscite is never held due to the fears that Kashmiris would not want to join India, that they would want to join Pakistan. And uh, instead, you have the installation of the infamous Article 370, which supposedly ensured Kashmir's autonomy, but in fact expands Indian control over Kashmir through the Indian constitution. And Dushinsky and Ghosh have called this process occupational constitutionalism, that is, occupation through constitution. <laughs> So 1947 is the moment of the inaugurating of the intersecting techniques of Indian colonial and settler colonial techniques of political, legal, and military occupations. So we know uh, this is August 5, 2019, fast forward. Uh, you have Hafsa Kanjwal writing in the Washington Post on August 5 saying, the headline says, India's settler colonial project in Kashmir takes a disturbing turn. Article 370 was removed in August 2019. Uh, Arthur Zia has argued that, and so of course Kashmir is annexed by India. Uh, Arthur Zia has argued that while most Kashmiris did not necessarily care for Article 370, Article 35A, which was part of um, that complex, protected Kashmiri ownership of land from Indians. Um, it was deoperationalized, thus formalizing settler colonial practices of Kashmir's political and uh, military occupation. Mushtaq and Amin argue, um, as I mentioned earlier, that some settler colonialism, uh, set, some settler colonial practices were already in place before the annexation of Kashmir through practices of India's military takeover of land, the destruction of Kashmiri homes, Kashmir's ecology. They make this argument with reference to scholar Sari Hanafi's work on spatial site. So that reference is significant, I think, in a 
in a context like this, because it's about thinking about the ways in which comparative scholarly work on Palestine and Kashmir yields insights. Alongside these destructive techniques of settler colonialism, India's claim over ancient um, over Kashmir as an ancient Hindu land, foundational to both secular and Hindutva Indian nationalism, is being redeployed or deployed aggressively now. So this idea of reclamation of land, which I think is very familiar to this context that we're witnessing outside here uh, in Sheikh Jarrah, but generally the whole idea of reclamation. Um, so this happened, uh, this is just an, you know, a, a discourse example as opposed to practice example, that practice example is going on, but this discourse um, in 2019, the Indian Consul General of New York, Sandeep Chakravarti told um, Kashmiri pundits in a private, I think, audience, he addressed um, them saying the Kashmiri culture is the Indian culture is the Hindu culture. They promised the audience that they could return to Kashmir saying, we already have a model in the world. If the Israeli people can do it, the implication is that we can do it. Um, so what is important to note here is that Kashmiri pundits, there's a complicated history there, which I don't have time to go into. But in the 1990s, there was armed rebellion against the Indian state by Kashmiris. Um, and they targeted um, Kashmiri pundits who were um, either working for the state or were affiliated with right-wing organizations. So there are Kashmiri pundits who are part of right-wing organizations and also Kashmiri pundits who are, you know, working, have much more left-wing sort of progressive um, uh, ways of uh, thinking and practicing and so on. But this is a complex history that is weaponized against Kashmiri Muslims by Indian governments. And so a lot of Kashmiri pundits in the 1990s left um, Kashmir, fearing for their lives. Um, and it's important to note here that the armed rebellion was against the state and three times as many Muslims were killed. But because of those tragic events of pundits leaving and many became refugees, this has been used success by successive Indian governments to paint the armed rebellion as exclusively Islamist and an issue of Hindu-Muslim communalization. And through this continuing narrative, the Indian state has been talking about resettling Kashmiri pundits back in Kashmir through townships. So not just returning them to their homes, but building townships and settlements which are separate. And the Kashmiri resistance leadership has been arguing, you know, even in 2016, for example, they called for pundits to return to their homes and settle amongst their neighbors rather than live in townships which would be modeled on the Israeli model. But the Indian government discourse now is even worse. They're not just talking about resettling Kashmiri pundits. As you can see from this uh, quotation by Sandeep Chakravarti, the discourse is about reclaiming land for, in, for Hindus in India, not just Kashmiri pundits, but Hindus and Indian Hindus. So there's an expansion of this reclamation discourse, and it is being aggressively deployed because of this idea of Kashmir as holy land for Hindus. So this is the point I was trying to make. Um, and you know, this is happening amidst uh, this whole, uh, you know, literally it's been happening since 2019, for example, there have been land reform legislation um, and what's happening in, in those land reform legislation, they've done away with uh, quite important, significant legislation in the 1950s, the land to till tiller reforms, which was a massive redistribution of land from you know, huge land holdings to back to the peasants. So this happened with local Kashmiri government of the time. Um, but they've done away with that since August 2019. They've removed the protections of Kashmiris as having the ex exclusive right to their own land in terms of ownership. And what they're doing is they're taking, um, they're talking about um, Kashmiris as encroachers, especially nomadic communities, but also, you know, um, tillers. They're calling them encroachers and are, you know, going on this drive of massive land reclamation. And this land is being reclaimed for the Indian state, for Indian settlers, for businesses and overseas investment. 
in the name of neoliberal development. So this corresponds in some ways to uh, the idea of this kind of neoliberal settler colonial techniques being deployed. Um, I'm sort of quoting, half quoting here from uh, my co-author Haris Zerger's work, whose work um, is about this idea of land uh, reclamation as a discourse emerging out of, um, um, you know, post-August 2019, but also, uh, you know, regularizing land in the name of transparency, regularizing land title, saying, well, oh, the earlier land title system was corrupt. Um, and you know we have we need transparency, so all of those are nullified. And so this idea of land title is being regularized in the name of transparency, but really it's a takeover of land itself. So this land reclamation narrative again a feature of Zionist settler practice in Palestine and now in the Kashmir context by the Indian state. Um, so the current, I hope I'm not going way over time. No. Yeah. Uh, so the current connections between Palestine and Kashmir are many. In speaking of settler colonialism as foundational for the current neoliberal global order, Lloyd and Wolf speak of military occupation, counter-terror strategies, surveillance and policing as settler colonial techniques deployed in the neoliberal present. And this, of course, you know, you mentioned the India-Israel alliance, which includes training, knowledge exchange of counter-terror practices, the arms trade mutual material and ideological support for the occupations of Kashmir and Palestine. So there's a book coming out by Azad Esaf on hostile, hostile homelands, um, which I think will map maps so the governmental and corporate components of the arms trade, the joint ventures of drone product production between Israeli and Indian corporations, Elbit and Adani, um, are a feature of this alliance. Um, I just want to mention in the UK Palestine Action, the direct action group uh, for Palestine has, has been shutting Elbit factories down, expressing solidarity with Kashmir as well. So while that's going on with the India-Israel alliance, there's also, you know, this kind of solidarity uh, and direct action uh, going on. And the current British British government, even as it is in shambles, is criminalizing all of these forms of protest including those that involve marching on the streets, not even direct action. So there are many points of connection to be explored. And I think some of this work will be showcased in the talks that um, Emma uh, and Tofik mentioned as part of the Palestine Kashmir network. It would be interesting to see more uh, engagement on these comparative in, uh, you know, strategies of settler colonial authoritarianism in relation to surveillance, media and social media expression, the treatment of media professionals, killing journalists here, detaining, harassing, intimidating journalists in Kashmir, uh, the criminalization of uh, scholarship, you know, like in Kashmir, um, I think there, there is a word intellectual terrorism, um, overground workers for terrorism, um, these are being deployed against the scholars that are part of the Kashmir Scholars Network. Uh, the criminalization of human rights. We have people like um, Kuram Purvez, um, um, the coordinator of the Jammu and Kashmir Coalition for Civil Society. He's been in detention since November, October. Um, and of course, the criminalization here, as you see, Al Haq and other organizations, uh, pink washing, and uh, uh, Article 370 was being uh, said to liberate gays and queer people in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, which was kind of a ridiculous claim because, and women, and yeah, gender, uh, the liberation of women um, in Jammu and Kashmir. So there's gender washing, pink washing, the construction of Hindu phobia, which is completely made up along the lines of the weaponization of anti Semitism to silence critics of state violence and colonialism. There are the techniques of detentions, everyday killings, the denial of medical care, not returning the bodies of the dead, the disallowance of mourning. So there is a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I have just a couple of cautions, which I said I would end with. Um, 
Recently, a scholar argued that mapping links between Palestine and Kashmir may be somewhat misguided because these histories are not similar. The argument is that similarities of state violence and authoritarianism are comparable across authoritarian states, India and China, for example. I agree that comparisons of state repression and violence could be made across the globe. That's the kind of era we're living in. <laughs> uh, but there are particular historical and contemporary points of connection through structuring settler colonial principles that link Palestine and Kashmir. So a network like this is particularly useful. On the flip side, we need to be attentive to the more general comparisons being made between India and Israel as oppressive states because of their geopolitical alliance and their ethno-nationalisms. So I'm, this is just, I'm not saying those comparisons shouldn't be made more generally. They can be made, but we need to understand the specificity. While Indian Muslims are facing the brunt of Hindutva, comparisons between the plight of Indian Muslims with Palestinians is not accurate. India's oppression of Indian Muslims is not settler colonialism, it's ethno-nationalism. India's occupation of Kashmir is an ethno-national settler colonialism. It's also worth noting that for Kashmiris, occupation did not begin with India's right wing, but its left wing governments. More than ever, it is important to ensure that the scholarship and activism that we engage in needs to be accurate um, in these dangerous times that we live in. Last slide. <laughs> so, yeah, I just wanted to end with that image, which again is from Palestine, Palestine Action. What I have been speaking of here are the distinct features that link Palestine and Kashmir, despite their distinct and different histories, emerging from the structuring and intersecting principles of settler slash colonialism. I hope that the aims of this network of building alliances and solidarities rooted in struggles for justice. Um, against the structuring principles of settler colonial discourse and practices are realized. Because people's struggles are interconnected, uh, I'm ending with this image, we may not know what futures lie ahead, but we hope it is one where our collective anti-colonial struggles generate just ways of living. Inshallah. <laughs> So I'd like to thank uh, Professor Goldie for uh, Osuru, Osuri, excuse me, for a brilliant and fascinating and very insightful uh, uh, opening keynote lecture to this uh, network. I don't think we could have asked for something better. Its nuance and its insight, I'm sure, was uh, was 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 bountiful for all who had the opportunity to listen to it, and also. We'll be sure to get this up on our website, that of the network, as well as that of the Kenyan Institute. Um, uh, what you said spoke for itself, and I, I'm a bit blown away by all the things that you have said, uh, particularly pointing to the various opportunities for intersection and mutual learning, but also the divergences, and, and, and it sharpens us as academic thinkers. I think, uh, and certainly engage scholars, which is something what we will need if we want to be more effective in building this network and, and, and bring, helping to bring about more just uh, situation in Kashmir and Palestine and beyond. Because I think also these case studies are so particular to that. I, I do not pretend to have a, a list of questions for you. I think what you said sp speaks for itself. I'm very happy and honored to have had the opportunity to uh, to, to, for us to launch this event, I do want to create the opportunity for those in the audience today, online or in person, to raise some questions. So uh, if there is anybody out there in that field of audience, <laughs> uh, you're more than welcome. We have one question in the background. So the first question in our hybrid uh, session will be, please say it into the microphone and introduce yourself if you like. Uh, thank you so much for that talk. It was uh, so fascinating. There's so much to talk about. My name is Ta'ir. Um, the thing I most wanted to ask you about is, I guess, something that you gestured towards at your ending. It's about forms of solidarity and what kind of solidarity are we talking about? Um, and what, what models do we have to work with? So I'm, I, in particular, I have in mind the a form of solidarity, that a, a basis for solidarity that I don't particularly like, which is 
comes at least in the Palestinian case out of a form exceptionalism that you were referring to before, right? Like the idea that Palestine is, is a, the remaining, the last colony, the last settler colonial case, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there, that's not the kind of solidarity I'm talking about. Um, I'm instead thinking of, I don't know how you want to put it, maybe like a, a post-colonial, a, a not quite, not realized post-colonial nation state solidarity, right? Like, so locations of the world that have that kind of a, a format to work with, or better yet, a, a um, deferred, not yet realized anti-colonial revolution, right? So what happens to solidarity, the forms of solidarity, if we take, um, my preference, the third option as the basis and what kind of a network emerges and how does that, so there's kind of two implications that come out of that in my thinking at this moment. I'm wondering what you have to, to say about this. One is what does that mean for, um, in relationship to other preceding uh, models of solidarity? So like anti-colonial, for example, how do we distinguish an anti-colonial versus an anti-capitalist uh, anti uh, uh, mode of solidarity? Or, and then also more specifically for the Kashmir Palestine relationship, what, what would an anti colonial, revolutionary, not yet realized, deferred, et cetera, et cetera, solidarity, um, what implication does that have for that relationship between Kashmiris and Palestinians rather than maybe rather than the Palestinian as a place, Palestine as a place and Kashmir as a place? Yeah, would you like to respond? <laughs> it's a big question. But why not? It's a big question. I'm not sure um, I can. And totally answer every bit of it or I feel like I, one cannot prescribe solidarity I will start with that um, but I think I take your point in terms of the kind of models of sol solidarity one does not want which is you know the exceptionalism model um, from what I can tell that's what you're saying but I think one thing I would say I mean you talked about do we distinguish between anti-colonial, anti-capitalist? I don't think we can. I I think the bound, you know, if you think about things like racial capitalism, for example, I, mean, I haven't sort of mentioned it, but that is very much part of the process of settler colonialism as well. It's not separate from it, right? So these are intertwined processes. So any anti-colonial solidarity has to also be anti-capitalist, one can say. Um, but then it's also, I think one important point to make with that is that rather than a prescriptive understanding of solidarity, it's also the materiality of place that one is speaking from and expressing solidarity from, and that matters and that shapes the kinds of solidarities that we engage in, which comes through struggle, <laughs> which is why I'm saying I, I you know, cannot say, oh, this is better or that is better. I have read articles where people say, well, solidarity has to be made and, you know, made through struggle, collective engagement. But I think I started this um, talk uh, with the idea of the ways in which Kashmiris have expressed solidarity. They're being arrested and killed. <laughs> so, you know, how, so in that context, what does one do? What is the materiality of that history? And yet at the same time, there are all these different ways in which these um, contexts um, have connections and points of connection and points of yielding insights for struggles for each other. So it can only come from that engagement, I guess that's what I would say. And, you know, like I said, this in that sense, um, this idea of generating more conversations, more scholar activists, but also activists, direct action, all of these things will generate their own understandings or they're more understandings is the wrong word but they're more forms of solidarity that will emerge out of that and i think that's a better way to approach it for me rather than me saying oh this is better or this is that but I, I completely agree with you that you know supposing is as the last settler colonial which is really odd because you i'm you know, thinking of i was quite you know reading fire fire says article for example it's 1965 it's way before say Patrick Woods or any of these scholars are talking about settler colonialism. So, I mean, there's other articles which say why it emerges and then why it disappears and so on in, in Palestine. But I mean, that's a different story, but I think it's important to understand these things as emerging through that kind of collective struggle. I don't know if that was the answer you were looking for, but <laughs> I think that's the best answer that I think I can do anyway. 
Thank you for the answer. I would encourage those in the audience online to put their questions in the question and answer feature. And I see we have two questions there. Maybe I'll take the first one here and then anyone in the audience in the local setting can also think of their ideas. So the first question that has appeared, and I haven't read it, so it's a bit cold uh, in terms of my uh, engagement with it. It comes from Abdullah Muaswis. I hope I got your name correct. I'm sorry about that if I did not. He says the following, Abdullah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this incredible keynote lecture and for working on this important project. I wanted to ask if Professor Asuri wanted to comment a little on the role of India's occupation of Kashmir historically played on the role India's occupation of Kashmir historically played in its foreign policy, especially vis-a-vis -vis India's historic public support for the Palestinian cause. Um, I think if I understand that question correctly, I mean, I've kind of written about it in the article Itineraries of Solidarity. And I have a bad memory, but if I remember my own argument, one of the things that I was talking about in that was teasing apart the, the expressions of solidarity with Palestine that India had, very strong, as you said, through UN resolutions and so on. But at the same time, um, if I'm not mistaken, was it the 1971 war um, or maybe earlier, but you also had India, um, you know, getting arms from Israel for its covert, covertly getting arms from, from Israel. So, so there's a bit of a dance. It's a different moment anyway. But in the current moment, um, you have quite a strong role in a way that Kashmir plays. Um, in terms of um, the relationship with India-Israel. And in that context, the dance that the Indian government has done is to kind of continue to express solidarity with Palestinians, um, but at the same time changing its, you know, we can see they've been abstaining from votes in the UN, for example, and instead talking about development and expressing developmental aid for Palestine. Um, but at the same time, continually sort of drawing on this anti-colonial capital. And, and one strand of that right wing is constantly making equations between Kashmir and Palestine as Islamist movements and the context of counter-terror discourse and things like that. So, yeah, there's very much a strong role, which becomes visible in a more contemporary era. I think in the in, in earlier eras, there was much more this covert play, not only with the arms trade, but, you know, strategically, you want to have alliances with Arab nations. And so there's a constant, you know, that kind of expression of support for Palestine. And also this idea that, at least theoretically, there's this idea that we want to also make Indian Muslims happy. You know, those kinds of uh, considerations are at play. I, I, one can, I mean, without having done more research, I cannot say whether one is true or not, but all of these considerations are always said to be in play. Yeah. But at the same time, in that context, in the earlier era, um, Kashi, Kashmiri Muslims, the, the, the Indian narrative on Kashmir has been so strong internationally. This idea that, oh, India has, you know, Kashmir has acceded to India. It is part of Indian administered Kashmir is part of India and it's Pakistan side, which is occupied, you know, so that discourse has been a continuing thing. Yeah. Uh, so uh, are there other questions in the audience? Uh, excellent, one more. Um, thank you for the lovely talk. Um, my name is Paul. Uh, the question is in the spirit of getting to know more about Kashmir. Um, so if we think about maybe Palestine under the mandate in like the early days of the Zionist movement, the question was or the problem was about like the transformation of an agrarian society or the destruction of an agrarian society. And so I'm kind of wondering like, what did, what did agrarian social relations or the agrarian question look like in Kashmir like at that time? And then maybe if we're thinking about the grounds of like solidarity today, is there a way to think about it coming out of like what people do with the land or their concerns with what the land is gonna be used for how to manage it? Thank you. That would be a very good question for those Kashmir scholars who are working on agrarian issues. I mentioned Haris Vergar, who's working on land um, issues. But I, I guess 
off the top of my head, what I would say is around that time, in 1846, I mentioned the Treaty of Amritsar. What the Maharaja does is come in, you know, the whole land is, you know, this whole region, peoples are sold to the Maharaja, and there's a complete dispossession of land, uh, taking away of land from, you know, and, and reducing everyone just to uh, this uh, absolute poverty, but working on the land. So in terms of agrarian issues, that's pretty much the case until the early you know, 20th century. Um, so, so it would be different from, say, what's happening here. But in a strange way, in fact, that wholesale transfer is also like the dispossession at that point. It's only after 19, the, after the, by 1950, when you have a local Kashmiri government, that that gets reversed somewhat you know, with the land to tiller reforms. Um, and then you're seeing now in 2019, a, a reversal of that and, you know, taking away. So I think in the current moment, definitely an engagement with that, uh, comparisons, uh, comparative engagement with that is very much, I would say, grounds for solidarity. This, this is exactly, I mean, since 2019, the legislation has been so rapid. Um, people are still, you know, they almost on a daily basis aghast at the level at which things are being taken away and dispossessed. Um, in legal terms, just in terms, you know, I mentioned this idea of, you know, this whole community suddenly declared encroachers. And so that land is just taken away either for military use or for developmental use or, or whatever, or even, you know, eco washing, you know, green washing. So all of these things are happening at this simultaneously. And from what I can tell, I mean, in, in Palestine, it's been going on for such a long time, but there's also an intensification <laughs> in the current moment. And that, I don't know, there's something about that intensification and that intensity, I think that, I don't know, definitely grounds for solidarity movements, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll take one more question from the question and answer session. Uh, a button, excuse me. So it's a question from I am. Uh, I respect, of course, the who desire not to uh, reveal identities. No worries. Uh, Kashmiris commonly see the Palestinian struggle for rights and self determination as their own, part of what Kashmiris are struggling for and willing to die for and do die for. And that is long standing. My sense is that Palestinians don't see that the Kashmiri struggle to simil this Kashmiri struggle similarly and generally are not that well informed about or that concerned about Kashmir, why? What might be done to increase awareness and understanding among Palestinians of Kashmir? Well, <laughs> well, I think they should join the Kashmiri Palestine Scholar Solidarity Network and start listening to our podcasts and our uh, webinars and what else we, we have down the line. Uh, you know, I think there's, so we have somebody in the audience who would like to add to the question. Go ahead, if, if it compliments, yes. Hi, my name is Subhai, and I was also wondering, I had a question, and I wondered, I wondered maybe that's a question that I better ask, um, or better directed to Tofi. How would you um, explain maybe the schism, <laughs> the schism that exists, if it exists indeed, between, um, say, um, the Palestinian leadership um, alignment with, um, say, the Indian government, and yet the Palestinian movement's um, support and solidarity for um, for Kashmir, and I think that's not uh, that's often uh, that's not the only schism. That perhaps exists when it comes to um, um, uh, foreign policy or um, um, alignment with um, uh, um, movements, um, um, say Syria, um, say. Um, the other, other, other movements. Sure. 
So I'll try to answer that. I mean, I'm, but it's similar and it's within the same vein, uh, well, particularly addressing, I think, the Palestinian leadership dimension to it as well. And um, so, I, I mean, I think we need to be relatively honest about it. The, the Palestinian National Liberation Movement, certainly in its later incarnation, the post-1967 incarnation was seen as so radical and so potentially threatening to regional order and global world dynamics that it became a largely privileged movement in terms of the extent to which it was embraced by certainly and received large amounts of funding from the Gulf regimes uh, who were scared uh, out of their minds about the potential for the infectious nature of the Palestinian movement upon their regimes. Okay, it should be said without, you know, I mean, it's, it's factually stated that the, the Middle East is filled with autocratic dictatorial regimes, some of whom are the remainders of old colonial legacies, others of failed revolutions or new revolutions or, or what not. But in any case, the Palestinian movement emerges out of the new Palestinian movement, emerges out of a rejection of both uh, uh, the, the failure of the patrician elites who had led the Arab struggle in 48, but also of the Arab regimes who had failed in 67. So everybody in the Arab world was trying to keep the Palestinian movement on their side to, to, to uh, so this led historically, ultimately to a kind of a centricism of uh, Palestinian uh, mentality. Uh, 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 and it, it infected deeply the PLO itself. Uh, and uh, of course, the PLO itself was not a movement in isolation from a much larger third world international dynamic of attempted uh, rise of the global south, the, the decolonial movement, the Bandung moment, uh, and, uh, and beyond. But um, uh, the depth of those politics and how uh, and where they ended up on the global stage and within the Palestinian is, is quite telling. Today, what Subhi is speaking about is basically ever since you know you have a a series of major defeats for and, and right wing shifts of the Palestinian movement from the mid seventies onwards, basically, and. A lot of that money also that I was talking about, the, the wealth that was poured into the movement. So uh, look, I'll be very frank about it. There, there, you, there's, there's some people even said that the Gulf regimes like the United Arab Emirates used to pay bribes to the PLO so that they would not hijack airplanes or so they, they would not do something locally. And the way the movements dealt with the Palestinian, uh, the way that, excuse me, uh, the Gulf, states dealt with the Palestinian movement was to fund the Fatah movement in particular as because Fatah ideologically relied upon charisma and maximalist discourse, but refrained from ideological affinity to a socialist agenda or an Islamist agenda or a class struggle or a struggle against old elites or whatnot. Even though Fatah does come from a struggle that was also trying to throw off the old patrician elite, but this made the Fatah movement, firstly, it empowered them, take control of the PLO, which was founded by, the, P, the, the, by the, the Arab states initially. And then it allowed them to use this maximalist discourse to, to, to claim radicalism, accept the sort of, and, and, and bask in the glory of this third world, uh, you know, uh, movement uh, of, uh, which it was, you know, deserving of, I would say, but but not particular to, and there were many other movements. At the same time, the Palestinian movement, of course, we should also acknowledge, played a major role in trying to provide support to other liberation movements in the region and beyond the region. So, I mean, that's the history and the nature of uh, the solidarity with this South African struggle today, et cetera. And to actually go back to the question of Kashmir, which came up in the last, last uh, question, as I understand it, the Kashmir, the Indians feared the creation of a pan-Islamic Arab bloc that could isolate the Indians. So India doubled down on its radicalism for Palestine to try and prevent that. What has happened with the neoliberalization of the movement is that this romantic discourse has collapsed. 
the third world movements have gone at the end of the bipolar uh, world order and the rise of a unipolar hegemonic US order led to the decoupling of the Palestinian solidarity movement uh, and allowed countries like India and China to create a relationship with Israel and a relationship with Palestine, which eventually over time has led to this sort of quite pathetic position that the Palestinian movement is in today, uh, including with its leadership, which basically will still, you know, although it was humiliating th four years ago when Modi came to Israel, Palestine, I believe it was the first time an Indian head of state came in to the country and he didn't even go to Ramallah. He went, hung out with, with Netanyahu on the beach and talked about yoga, talked about agriculture and, and military and all, all these kinds of cooperations. And then he left. I mean, and it was a real egg on your face for the Palestinian movement. But this is the leftovers of the Oslo compromise. This is the leftovers of many other historical dimensions that I don't have time to go into today. So I think there is over concentration in the Palestinian movement of uh, reliance upon. Uh, a non, you know, uh, uh, the fact that Fatah was able to dominate the structure and that the left and the other movements in the Palestinian movement were actually bought into the arrangement of the PLO. They became a loyal opposition that was not willing to, to actually fight democratically within the movement to actually have it represent more, more causes. And uh, this leaves us in the situation today where. Uh, you know, where, where Palestinians don't know enough about other struggles. They have his, certain traditions, important to acknowledge this, uh, in the Palestinian movement are, are well aware and are connected to and have an, an, a, a, of the broader movements from Kurdistan to, uh, you know, South Africa to Ireland to, to many other struggles. But as an active political movement at this stage, Palestinians are trying to hold on to the territory and not keep, not, not lose ground even further. And these lead to are part of much deeper structural issues and ideological issues and, and as well as tactical ones that uh, that that come after 30 years of this unipolar hegemonic moment which is now potentially breaking but breaking out into global world war three potentially and palestine and israel are still on the fault lines of that and we also see india and israel also on the fault lines of this very clearly today so uh Sorry, that was my abuse of the microphone. <laughs> we have six more minutes and at least one question online from Rebecca Vince. So, but we have some good questions. Look at that, folks. This is very exciting to see some more questions coming up. So as long as people are all right to continue, I'm fine. You know, we don't want to get, make this go on too much further, just to often, but we have a loyal audience both in-house and online. So we're happy to keep on going. So we have a question from Rebecca Vince who says, my question is about the potential for Muslim Jewish solidarity in India, and if slash how this might relate to Kashmir. On a recent research trip, I sensed a solidarity between Muslim and Jewish minorities in India, although only a handful of Jews remain in Kerala, for example, and noticed that many of the synagogues, for instance, in Kolkata, are looked after by Muslims. I'm not sure if or how this relates to Kashmir, but would be interested to know your thoughts. Ideas on that, Goldie? Well, I mean, I think, um, I, I'm not sure I have, I mean, the person who's asking the question, Rebecca, you might have more of an idea about Jewish Muslim solidarity in India than I do. Um, I'm not sure how it relates to Kashmir, to be honest. So, you know, I'm not going to venture into territory I know nothing about. Um, yeah. Fair enough. No luck there, Rebecca. All right, we'll go on to Zafar Bangash. Excuse us. So here we go. Zafar asked the following question. Thank you for this enlightening presentation. My question relates to the U.S. obsession with containing China and seeking India as a partner in this venture. How much impact could such a solidarity network have at that practical level? I am all for such solidarity. In Canada, we have been striving for such solidarity for many years, but its impact is minimal because at the official level, there's an inherent bias in favor of Israel and India. Zafar Bangash, Bangash, excuse me, from Toronto, Canada. Here we are, a good fitting last question that uh, we're gonna give Goldie the mic to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Um, Zafar, I mean, I think 
there is a reason why the Indian government is so afraid of Kashmiri speaking out. <laughs> there is a reason why somebody's arrested for a fake, you know, an emoji on Twitter, <laughs> or you know, it's seen as sedition against the sovereignty and integrity of India. <laughs> so we might not think that there is an any effect of you know the rag tag band of people who express solidarity with each other but i think there is a great power in solidarity movements which you know you know had the image up about the direct action shutting a little bit fact, uh, factories down in in the uk but apart from that just the narrative you know india has for so long controlled this narrative that india that kashmir is part of india and that any other any movements in kashmir for self-determination or freedom are Pakistan sponsored, that's the narrative. But the truth is that this, these movements are indigenous Kashmiri movements fighting against India. Um, and so for even for that narrative to come out, for even someone to just say something somewhere is, seems to be a huge threat. They are absolutely paranoid and they hate it when there are international headlines in the Washington Post or the New York Times or wherever saying India's settler colonial project in Kashmir takes a disturbing turn. In fact, the vocabulary and lexicon of colonialism and settler colonialism, at least as far as I know, it was there among scholars or uh, activists and so on, but to have that in the mainstream was a big shift suddenly. And I think they're terrified of the, that discourse. So we might not think that there is an effect, but there is. So on that note, hopeful note, I would argue, I would like to thank our keynote speaker today, Dr. Uh, Professor Goldie Osuri, uh, as well as to thank the CBRL for hosting us and the Kashmiri Palestine Scholars Solidarity Network, as well as the audience in-house and online for a very enriching, enlightening, and uh, wonderful event uh, today. So thank you for all being with us today. Uh, I'm sorry we cannot offer the participants online the light refreshments that are in our uh, lobby over here but uh, everybody can know that we are going to have some nice drinks and some small snacks there so folks think i would like to use this opportunity to thank everybody and to sign off and uh, keep in charge of our website where we will have future events yes this is important and tomorrow we have a very important event which is the launch of the first of the kashmir palestine conversation series so that series will show, will, will attempt, as, as Emma, uh, Professor Brandon described previously, as it, bring a, a Palestine scholar, a Kashmiri scholar, and oftentimes where possible, a moderator from the common field of, of the subject matter, where there are points of intersection that we want to highlight and speak to. So the, the, the event tomorrow is regarding the actual, we will screen the film, Bring Him Back, which speaks of the possession, the, the right to prevent, the attempt to prevent mourning on behalf of the colonial state, in the case of India over Kashmir, the non-return of bodies, in this case of Maqbul Bhatt, this is what the film addresses, Kashmiri nationalist Maqbul Bhatt, which is a practice that is also practiced here in Israel-Palestine, and which we will have Dr. Suhad Dahir Nashif speaking to tomorrow, uh, so the film is 25 minutes, and then Dr. Suhad will speak and engage for another 20 minutes, and then we'll take similar questions and answers. So, and then, please take the microphone. Okay. As well as the producer and uh, an editor, uh, Tarat Bhatt. Excuse me for being, uh, for, for that terrible oversight. We have, in fact, what, there's something even much more important about this event tomorrow. I, we came to know about this film, I personally came to know about this film when it was first broadcast at the University of Westminster in 2016 or 15 about it. Okay, the film was directed by film producer Fahed Shah. Fahed Shah was the editor and is the editor of the Kashmiri Walla, which is an important journalistic English language resource on what's happening in Kashmir. Fahed has been in prison for the last two months. When we started organizing for this event today, we, and we're in communication with Talat, who is the producer of the film. Fahed was free. Fahed is an example today of why the Solidarity Network is, needs to happen and folks need to be involved in it. 
So come out tomorrow to watch that film. We also have on our website the other potential points of intersection, which we're going to address, including the settler colonial economic dimensions, the literature and, uh, and culture and, and, and poetry dimensions, uh, and also the, the popular resistance uh, dimensions as well, and the popular movements dimensions. And that's only the start, folks. So hopefully this is just the start of a lovely relationship. So looking forward to going on that journey together. And thank you for everybody who came out today to attend this event. Take care. Have a good night.